The NCAA made some long anticipated changes yesterday, deregulating conference title requirements for conferences. Is that good news for BYU and the future of the Big 12? We'll get into that. We'll also talk about the change in the initial counter rule. 25 guys is no longer the limit for teams in terms of signing players. Could that benefit BYU? We'll touch on both of those topics. We'll also talk about Amber Whiting being hired as the BYU women's basketball coach. A bit of a surprise hire coming from the high school ranks. How much concern should there be on that front? We got all that and a whole lot more on today's edition of Locked On Cougars. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, my friends? I'm Jay Catch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, your resident BYU insider. I work for the Zone Sports Network in Salt Lake City, Utah. But big thank you for making us your first listen right here on Locked On Cougars. We love being with you guys. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. We are also on YouTube if you have not done so already. I would encourage you guys to subscribe to the show. Got some special news we need to talk about towards the end of today's show about how we're going to celebrate reaching the 500 subscriber mark on our YouTube channel. Still looking to continue to add listeners. We need to get to a thousand and we'll continue to build beyond that. But we got some fun stuff to talk about on today's show. So without further ado, let's talk about the changes the NCAA made yesterday. And those are that now no longer will you be required to either play a round robin format or have two divisions in a conference to stage a conference title game. That means as BYU gets ready to go into the Big 12, the talk of how you're going to break up the conference into divisions, it doesn't have to happen. We saw the Pac-12 minutes after this announcement came, announced that they are getting rid of their format for determining the North and South Division champions to play in a conference title game. It is going to be the best two teams in the conference. They could be both from the same division, and they can play for that conference title. Uh, the funny thing about this, just to draw in the comparison for the Pac-12, is in the 11 seasons they have had a conference title game, five of those matchups in the conference title game would have been different had these new rules been in effect. So, I think the biggest thing for the Big 12 and BYU moving forward here is it allows the Big 12 to have to well not have to look at different options in terms of scheduling how they're going to make the conference uh, stand apart from other conferences they can go with a pod system where you've got either four uh, pods of three or three pods or four you could play similar to what the ACC is anticipating to do they have a 355 model where they're going to have three set opponents every year they're essentially rivals and then the other 10 teams in the conference beside you you'll play five of them one year five the other year there are so many different uh, circumstances Circumstances that could be played around with the Big 12 here. And it'll be interesting to see where it all shakes out. But the biggest thing is I think this is going to allow conferences to have extra uh, chances, I guess is a, a term to use, or just a better opportunity to have their top teams, their undefeated teams, or maybe a one-loss team, have a best opportunity to make the college football playoff. Now, I am fully expecting the college football playoff is going to expand at some point in the relatively not too distant future after the conf- after that uh, contract comes up in 2026. I think you see it go to 12 teams, but in the interim, getting rid of this requirement to have the conference title between the division winners allows you to avoid scenarios. Let's say in the Big Ten, the Big Ten uh, East, I believe, is the com- is the side of the conference that has Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan. Those are the top dogs in the conference. All three of them in the same division, and there have been years potentially where you could see a 12 and 0 team, an 11 and 1 team, and a 10 and 2 team. Meanwhile, in the West Division, you've got a team like Wisconsin, who's not a bad team. Let me be clear about this, but they're sitting there at maybe eight and four, and they're somehow the com- Conference title game opponent for a 12 and 0 Ohio State or a Michigan, whoever it might be. You need to avoid that if you're the Big 12 moving forward here. So I really like the deregulation of this. It is going to be a benefit to the Big 12 conference. Now, I also want to talk about the other rule that was changed by the NCAA, and this is going to benefit one program in particular in the Big 12, and that being Kansas, is that they have gotten rid of for at least two years, it's a two-year interim rule, where the initial 25-man counter rule has been lifted and will no longer be in effect. 
you didn't know what that was there, you have 85 scholarship players in each university that you can have guys on scholarship. Well, the only thing, the only requirement around that is that you can only bring in 25 scholarship players in any given year, whether that's transfers, high school signings, guys coming back off missions in the case of BYU, no matter what is only 25 guys can join that program in any given year that is being done away with. It is going to allow a program like Kansas who for the better part of uh, actually no longer than a decade now has been operating at, I would say at the very best with maybe around 60 scholarship players. There have been some circumstances. I think shortly after the Charlie Weiss failed uh, experiment out there in Lawrence, they were down to like 37 scholarship players. They've been playing far f- with, with far less of a full deck than their conference mates. This is going to allow a program like Kansas. Let's say just for example, I don't know what their scholarship numbers are at, but say they're at 55 scholarship players. They could sign in, uh, in next year's recruiting class. They could bring in 35, not 30, 55, 30 guys, excuse me. Don't do math on air. That's actually a lesson I probably should hold to. But they could sign 30 scholarship players next year to get themselves to the full complement of 85 players. Now, are they going to be 30 stud, blue chip, five-star talents? Absolutely not. We're talking about Kansas here. But with this rule change, this is allowing all of the uh, programs around the country to get themselves back up to 85 scholarships. And the other, I'm going to say a uh, dirty side of this could be that you could see a number of guys essentially pushed out the door by eight coaches because they oversigned. Oversigning is when you go beyond that 25 man recruiting class. It was something that existed for a number of years, especially in the SEC. They would sign routinely 30 or more kids, and suddenly, oh man, we're out of scholarships here. Well, the bottom five of you on scholarship here, well, you can either move on to another uh, program, you can be a walk on, you just essentially get moved along. I'm not saying that BYU or any other program is going to do this, but it is going to be an option for coaches to do something of that ilk. If you feel like the bottom quarter, the bottom third of your team is just not good enough to compete at the level you're competing at, in theory, you could essentially force them out the door and go out and sign the guys you think that will get you to where you want to be. I would have my uh, issues saying that if you were to dump, let's say, 20 of your 85 guys and suddenly think that you're going to bring in 40 guys and they're going to be better than the 20 guys who left. I don't know if that necessarily that math is going to check out. If you're Alabama, it probably does check out. But in the case of a BYU, you got to be a little more careful uh, with your numbers and how you go about things. So it's going to be a very interesting era moving forward here. The, the interesting part is, is that initial counter rule is only going to affect for two years. That'll allow a program like Kansas to get themselves back to 85 scholarship players and actually play with an even deck for the first time in well over a decade. That's that's a positive for Kansas because they need that. They needed this type of a rule. A program like BYU, routinely, I think BYU has been operating between that 75 and 85 scholarship player number. And I don't think this is necessarily going to see BYU turn over this roster and say, we're going to sign 50 new guys. I don't see the Cougars doing that. I, I don't think Lonnie Sitake is going to operate that way. This rule, it's been needed to allow programs like Kansas to get off the deck and become more competitive. And it will allow team like BYU. And the, the, other, the other side of this is it's allowing teams that maybe get rocked by a spate of transfers. Let's say your coach gets hired by another university and suddenly half your roster seemingly has entered the transfer portal and is taking off for other places. Well, it allows a new coach to come in and immediately get his numbers back to where he thinks they need to be to compete. What I advocate for a coach, let's say you come in to a program that you uh, maybe have, let's say, 50 guys on scholarship when you take over as a coach. Would I advocate for a coach to go out there and immediately just take 35 guys on scholarship and say, you guys are the guys we're going with? No, I actually wouldn't encourage that. I'd actually encourage these coaches to look a little more at the walk-on ranks, which is something BYU has done for many, many years to great effect, and give those guys the scholarships. They have been working out with the team. You know what you have in them, and they have actually are guys that in many cases probably are more deserving of a scholarship than some high school kid that you probably would just be tossing an offer at just to fill a, fill a quota in your mind. So there's a lot of different dynamics with this, but the good news is it allows programs like Kansas or any other program that has their coach leave uh, to get themselves competing right away, get themselves right back into a competitive format in terms of having the overall numbers to compete. But the other side of it is, Ooh, you could see some guys get pushed out of a program and that could be a very interesting dynamic of how many guys a coach decides to turn over and any season.
year? Uh, does a coach that maybe took over from a coach and feels like, you know what, the bottom quarter of my roster is just absolute, you know what, I need to get, move them on. Make for an interesting dynamic in that regard. But I, I, I said, this gives opportunities on both the positive and the negative for uh, college football. But I think the overall moves here, both the conference title deregulation, the requirements for that, as well as this initial counter rule, I think they have an overall positive impact on the sport. And I think it's going to help BYU Big 12 as they get ready to enter era of their conference as these programs like BYU come into the conference in 2023. At least BYU is going in in 2023. We still have heard only reports that the other three from the American Athletic Conference are intending to go in 2023. I can tell you this much. BYU, July 1, 2023, BYU will be plastering that Big 12 logo everywhere because it will be officially be official that BYU is a Big 12 school. All right, we need to talk about a move that BYU thinks is going to set themselves up for success in women's basketball moving forward here, as well as some recruiting Recruiting news on the men's basketball front. We'll get to both of those topics here momentarily. First, though, today's show is brought to you in part by our partners over at Bet Online. They continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs in the NBA. Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures all online. Now, BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action available to you now. If you want to get in early and get some uh, early action on the Big 12 title odds, we actually talked about those last week. You can do that now. It's BetOnline, BetOnline.net, where the game starts. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. I want to encourage you guys to make sure you go check out the Locked On NBA Big Board Show. Host Raphael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and the author of the NBA Big Board Newsletter. He is joined by such luminaries as Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Leif Tulin to give uh, fans an in-depth look at the NBA Draft. Obviously, uh, BYU is hoping to have a guy like Alex Barcelo get an opportunity, but if you want to get the latest when it comes to the NBA Draft, if you're an NBA fan in terms of your team and their draft, circumstances where they land in the lottery or beyond that check out locked on nba big board it's free and available wherever you get your podcast all right so on the basketball front for BYU, let's start off with the men's side of things. I am expecting this week to hear uh, some news on some new commitments. And one could come as soon as today, and that is Mo Njia, the transfer from Eastern Michigan, the six foot ten big man, seven foot two wingspan, a guy that BYU had been recruiting before he went to Eastern Michigan, has had uh, some success at the college ranks, has three years of eligibility to remain. He has announced that he's going to announce today, Thursday, and depending on when you listen to this, it may already be out there, but he is intent on uh, picking either SMU or BYU. I am of the opinion that BYU feels fairly confident. Actually, I'm not of the opinion. I have talked to somebody who told me that BYU feels very confident that they will get NGIA if everything goes according to plan. But obviously, that can change literally minute by minute, and that could be null and void, and he could pick SMU just as easy as BYU. But I think him teaming with the Tiki Ali Atiki gives BYU quite the center tandem going into Big 12 play. Now, the other interesting dynamic of this is Kim Aiken. I saw this earlier this week that there's a, a a crystal ball on 24 seven sports that says they believe that Kim Aiken will pick BYU. The swing man uh, from Arizona left the program down there in Tucson in December. He's a guy who's an interesting uh, two way player can rebound really well for his position as kind of a small forward combo guard type player, but also has capability of shooting it and being a scorer also on the other end of the court uh, in terms of his overall offensive ability. So I'm interested to see if he ultimately picks BYU as well. If that crystal ball comes to fruition, he's got good size, six foot seven, 215 pounds. He'd only have one year to play for BYU. So both him and Rudy Williams, who's already signed up with BYU, They'd probably uh, comprise part of the backcourt for BYU during uh, this upcoming season. But I think you could do a lot worse than those guys on that roster because I think it gives BYU some positional versatility. It bolsters the front court, allows a guy like Fus Triori to have to avoid playing that five spot, allows him to play more of that four uh, forward spot, the power forward for your old school uh, listener types to let him have the offensive freedom that I think that many BYU fans and myself 
think that he needs to really achieve what he can ultimately achieve as a Cougar. But I think you're going to get some good news today at some point, hopefully on Mo and Gia. I have no idea on the Kim Aiken thing. I just saw that crystal ball. And typically when people put it in a crystal ball, they've got some intel somewhere that's telling them that they expect a guy to end up at that university. And it sounds like Kim Aiken could be on his way to BYU. And like I said, we'll take more of a broad picture look at what the uh, basketball program looks like for BYU once this signing period is over, once everything's kind of put to bed, once this roster is fully assembled, we'll look back and say, okay, how did Mark Pope do here? Obviously, we're still waiting to hear on his assistant coach hire. Hire, excuse me. I can tell you this much. Cahill Fennell, who uh, the Salt Lake Tribune said that they expect to be hired as BYU's new assistant coach, he arrived in Provo earlier this week to formally interview for the job to check out the lay of the land in Provo to just see the program, the facilities, all that type of stuff. But nothing is is impending based on what I understand with that. That could change, obviously, but uh, the report, I think, was a little hasty on the Salt Lake Tribune side of things because Cahill Fennell had never visited BYU when they uh, had announced that he was going to be the new assistant for BYU per multiple sources. My sources on the ground in Louisville who talked to Cahill Fennell told me that he finally traveled out to BYU earlier this week. He is here now and checking things out, and We'll see how it all shakes out, but I also heard that there are up to three other names in the mix for that assistant coaching job, and that's the very interesting dynamic here as we pivot to women's basketball, and that is that the hire of BYU for the women's basketball program comes from outside the program. BYU Athletics Director Tom Homo announced the hire of Amber Whiting as the head women's basketball coach that came uh, Wednesday when I'm recording this podcast. The quote here, I am thrilled to have Amber Whiting leading our BYU women's basketball program through our hiring process. We discovered a coach with a well-thought-out specific plan for the future of this team. Amber has had a unique and widespread experience in basketball, has a great feel for the women's game and the direction it is heading at BYU in the Big 12 and nationally. Now, this is a homecoming of sorts for Whiting. She's been coaching in Idaho. She is the wife of former BYU star Trent Whiting. Many of you might remember him if you're older like myself. Trent was a former All-Mountain West Conference performer in 2000-2001 after a career at both Snow College and Utah before getting to BYU. Some crazy dynamics in terms of getting him eligible eligible to play for the Cougars, but a stud player for the men's basketball program. Amber Whiting was also a standout player for the women's basketball program after her own pilgrimage of playing college hoops at Snow College and some other universities. She is from Ogden, Utah. She is now the seventh head coach since BYU had a women's basketball program join their varsity sports in 1972. She takes over for Jeff Judkins after 21 seasons for Juddy on the bench. This is an interesting hire because she is coming from the high school ranks. Burley, Idaho. She led them to a state title this past season. Took over a program at Burley that had won, I think, five games the year she the, before she took over. She led them to back-to-back 20-plus win seasons. They went 25-1 and one this past year, winning the 4A state title in Idaho. But that is the coaching experience that she has coming to BYU and stepping up to a Power 5 program for the Cougars. There has been a lot of angst out there on social media. And I know that women's basketball doesn't register the same level as, say, men's basketball or any of some of the other sports out there, especially football. But there have been copious amounts of high school coaches who have been hired as head coaches at the college level. And the the track record for them is mixed. Uh, I think some of the most famous include Jerry Faust, of course, who was the Notre Dame head coach, who was a high school coach there in South Bend. If I recall correctly, it did not pan out well for him at Notre Dame. He was in over his head. It felt like, and he was fired. But uh, the one thing I will say in the defense of Amber Whiting is she has raised high level athletes. Jace Whiting, their son is a guy who just came home off of a mission for the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He is signed to play at Boise state. I have no clue if his mom being hired in Provo would change the dynamic with him in terms of potentially playing for the Broncos or making a move to BYU. I've got no clue on that front. So I'm not trying to say anything there, but also, Amari Whiting, that's a name some of you might have heard. That is the Whiting's daughter. They have two kids, Jace and Amari. Amari is a top 50 athlete in her recruiting class. She is a junior this year. She'll be a senior next year. She is already verbally committed to play for the University of Oregon, but could her mother taking over in Provo persuade her to come to BYU to play there? She is an elite level athlete. We're talking about a a young woman who could be on her way to the WNBA. She is a phenomenal athlete phenomenal basketball player. She comes from a phenomenal family. Like I said, both the Whitings, Trent and Amber, both played at a very high level in the college realm. Uh, Trent went on to a 12-year career in Italy. 
this will be interesting to see how it all goes for Amber Whiting. Uh, she does have other experience in the AAU circuit. She has been the head coach for Adidas 17U3 SSB select team for the playing and summer shoe circuit for the Natalie Williams. And she's also directed Utah Hard Knocks, which is one of the most successful AAU programs in BYU, consistently producing Division I talent for both men's and women's programs around the state. So I know that she's only coached at the high school ranks, the AAU ranks, and I guess the 17U level for Adidas. But I will say one thing. There are good coaches out there, and they coach at different levels. I played for one of the greatest coaches that I have ever gotten to know when I was in the youth ranks. We're talking pre-high school. This was a gentleman that, in my opinion, if he was given the right opportunity, could have been a phenomenal, I think, coach at the college or maybe even the pro level. He just seemed to have that coaching gift. There's a gift to all of this. And if you have it, you have it. If you don't, you don't. And that's that's the case at every level of football, it seems like. But I think that uh, the one other thing I want to add to this, and this kind of builds off a thing I talked about yesterday, about Tom Homo trusting in him to put the schedule back together after that Tennessee cancellation. Our good friend Tricky uh, Tanner reached out and said that the hashtag should be Tom can handle it. And that's one thing I think is actually really good. Way. Tom can handle it. Because think about this. The women's basketball program is in a very good spot right now. Juddy is not leaving the cupboard bare. He's did a lot of good things during his two decades plus running that program. Uh, and there is some very, very good talent in that program. The other thing is Tom Homo's track record since he took over as BYU athletics director with the women's sports in particular, he has put them on a very very good footing. He has found good coaches. He has allowed them to go out there and find good athletes. They have had great success in their various realms of the sports that they play. I am going to trust that Tom Homo understands what he is doing, hiring Amber Whiting from the high school ranks to take over a power five women's basketball program. I get that there are people who have angst about this saying that guys like Ray Stewart got overlooked. Lee Kamar got overlooked. I get all that. Both of those guys, by the way, could be in the mix for an assistant job on the men's coaching staff. If Tom, if uh, not Tom Homo, if Mark Pope just wants to look down the hall, literally, he could have two candidates, I think, right there. Uh, Melanie Pearson Day, I think she absolutely could be a candidate to stay on with BYU. I talked with some people at BYU. There is no uh, word on how uh, – Whiting, Coach Whiting is going to go about uh, putting together her assistant coaching staff. She could keep the same assistants that Juddy had. I think that she would probably shake it up a little bit, but there is still a lot to be determined on this front. But the good news is BYU's women's basketball coaching search is at an end. And now we trust that uh, Coach Whiting will lead the Cougars forward here into the Big 12. And if what Tom said, she has a well thought out specific plan for the future of this team. If she has a great feel for the women's game and the direction it's heading at BYU in the Big 12 and nationally, if she truly has that, this could actually be a very, very good hire for BYU. But only time will tell. I am going to say hashtag Tom can handle it. Tom has done a great job hiring women's coaches at BYU. He's done a great job with his overall coaching uh, record in terms of his hires for BYU over the years. So let's trust that Tom Homo knows what he's doing. And like I said, if you can coach and you're a good coach, it doesn't matter what level you can come from or what level you do come from. If you can do it, you will have the opportunity to prove it on the court. And that is what Amber Whiting is going to have standing out to her and the opportunity she has facing her as she moves into this new job. And some very interesting times ahead. I do wonder how she will go about putting together her assistant coaching staff. And like I said, I do wonder if a guy like Lee Kamard and or Ray Stewart could suddenly become a candidate for that open assistant coaching job with the men's basketball program. I'm just saying, I, I'm not reporting anything. I am just uh, speaking into the universe, kind of thinking about stuff that I have had in my head all day long after this news broke. All right, coming up here in just a minute, we need to talk about BYU men's golf. They have punched their ticket to the national championships with a phenomenal, and I mean phenomenal run at the Stockton Regional, especially relative to where they were ranked going into that. We'll talk about that. And also, I need to get to two more members of our top 50 player countdown. Uh, I forgot. I have a special edition of the podcast coming on Friday that I forgot to highlight one of them. So we're going to get another two for one on today's edition of the podcast in terms of former Cougars that we'll talk about here momentarily. First, though, let's talk about brownies and more in particular, the brownie butter puff, brownie batter puff, brownie butter. That actually sounds pretty good too. brownie batter puff from our friends at Built Bar. Of course, I think all of us love brownies. We all love looking that spoon with the brownie batter after we eat it. It seems like half of us probably eat half of the brownie batter before we even put it in the oven. But the best part is, if you want that same type of a deal in a more healthy form, give the brownie 
batter puffs from Built Bar a chance. They're back for a limited time right now. They're absolutely incredible. They have the birthday cake flavor as well, banana cream. Essentially, any and all the puff flavors from Built Bar are incredible. They're soft, they're pillowy, they are just easy to chew, and they are phenomenal. Covered in 100% chocolate, you will not believe how good they are for you relative to how good they taste. The macros on this brownie batter puff, 140 calories, 17 grams of protein, just 7 grams of sugar. They are the perfect pick-me-up for any type of whatever activity you got going on. So give them a shot, my friends. Get to Built Up. Uh, excuse me, built.com. While you're there, use the promo code locked 15 for 15% off your order. Uh, these protein bars from built bar are absolutely incredible. The best part is it's a collagen protein, which is healthy for you guys. Your body absorbs it more readily. So give it a shot. Once again, that's built.com. Place your order. Now use the promo code locked 15 for 15% off your order and get enjoying the best tasting protein bars and do it with our friends at built bar. All right, before we go on today's show, let's talk BYU men's golf, and in particular, Carson Lundell. What a phenomenal run he had at the NCAA Men's Golf Championships at the NCAA Stockton Regional. He fired a four under par final round to win the NCAA Stockton Regional as the medalist and help BYU punch their ticket to the NCAA Championships in two weeks out at Greyhawk Country Club in Arizona. BYU as a team posted a 27 under three day total to qualify for their 29th appearance at the NCAAs, which will be held May 27th through June 1st at Greyhawk Golf Club in Scottsdale, Arizona. All five Cougars posted subpar rounds on the final day at the Stockton Regional to just lock up that spot. BYU is in a very advantageous spot. It's sitting tied for third going into that final day. The funny thing about this is BYU men's golf is peaking at the perfect time. Bruce Brockbank, this team went up and down seemingly every week and every tournament that I tracked for them this entire season. But when it mattered most at the WCC championships, now at the NCAA Stockton Regional, this team has stepped to the forefront, led by Carson Lundell. But guys like Cole Ponich have been very, very good for BYU. Uh, and it's a phenomenal time to watch BYU men's golf do this. Do I expect BYU to go to the NCAA championships and win it? No, I don't think so. I think that Arizona State, led by Preston Summerhays, by the way, who's another local product here in the state of Utah, is probably the favorite to win the title on their home course down there in Scottsdale. But the good news is for BYU men's golf right now is they are doing work and they're peaking at the right time. Could they place nationally? It'll be interesting. There's also an interesting dynamic with the NCAA championships is that they have a round of golf that is scheduled for Sunday and BYU under rule does not participate in sports on Sunday. And they will actually play that round on Wednesday ahead of the actual start of the tournament on Thursday. The pins will be set up for Sunday. It actually is considered to be a little bit of an advantage for other teams because they can go out and watch BYU's golfers play and see where the pins are set up for that Sunday format. The only dynamic is if BYU gets good weather versus maybe some bad weather or wind, that type of stuff could change the dynamic, but that's just the BYU rule that's in effect. The NCAA has put it there. It's been there for decades, and it's not going anywhere. The good news is BYU men's golf is competing for a national championship. 29 times they've been to the NCAAs. They do have a very rich history. They have won NCAA titles in men's golf before, but the good news is you got to get there and BYU did. And they did it in phenomenal fashion. BYU is ranked number 46 in the country going into this. I think you're going to see them vault up in the national rankings. It would not surprise me to see them inside the top 30 in the national rankings. Once the tournament begins out there at Greyhawk. So some very, very good news. If you're a golf fan and especially for BYU golf, it's really fun to see. I'm really, really enjoying watching this men's golf program. They've got some pieces. They've got a lot of good stuff going on right now, and it'll be interesting to see where it all shakes out. But I really, really like what we're looking at for men's golf at the moment. All right, before we go, let's get to two more players in our top 50 player countdown. In the independent era today, we are talking about one of the defensive linemen I think could have a second career on the pro wrestling circuit if you were to choose to pursue it. That is Bracken L. Bakri, the former BYU defensive lineman, played for the Cougars from 2018 to 2020, became an absolute stalwart for that BYU defensive line. Uh, and what I love about Bracken is he was just an affable human being. So much fun to talk to six foot three, 290 pounds out of Cottonwood Heights, Utah and Brighton high school. Uh, Bracken was just an absolute bear on the field. Just did his job to the best the possibly could was a phenomenal, phenomenal football player. I always love talking to him and just with his personality, 
I always thought if he wanted to pursue professional wrestling, he could be absolutely make himself into a pro wrestler. He's got the body type. He's got the personality. I don't know if he ultimately will do that, uh, but I think that Brackenell Backer was a very easy pick to be in this top 50 of the greatest players of the independent era for BYU. Now, for his career, he had 108 total tackles, 47 of them solo, three and a half sacks, uh, two and a half of those coming in his final season in 2020, seven and a half tackles for loss, uh, and one forced fumble, three quarterback hits. So some really good stuff. And by the way, he does have a touchdown for his career. He did play some fullback early on during his days at BYU. Uh, he has a grand total of four carries for six yards, an average of 1.5 yards per carry, a career long carry of two yards. I know, oh, by the way, one touchdown in his BYU career. I loved Brack and I thought he was an absolute sensation in terms of talking to him. And I think that he will be successful in whatever he does. But like I said, he was a guy that I just thought talking to him, if he wanted to go in like the WWE or uh, AEW, one of these pro wrestling leagues, I think he could make it if he really wanted to put the time into it. But we'll see. Uh, the, on the other side of things, in terms of our non-independent area, we're going to talk about a guy who's got a BYU's current team, and that is former BYU standout Byron Rex. Six foot two, 240 pounds, playing for BYU from 1990 to 1992. He is the father, as many of you probably put together, of Isaac Rex, who is the stud tight end for BYU currently. But Byron really set the pace for his son. Before his career, the numbers actually weren't as astounding because he was a second and third option throughout his career, but an absolute sensation nonetheless. He had 87 receptions for his career, 1,209 yards, seven touchdowns. His son in one season in 2020, if you recall, Isaac Rex just blew by his dad and there's been a lot of questions asked of Isaac of terms of his relationship with his dad and the records that he may have may or may have passed or will pass from his father, but Isaac has always talked about the fact that his dad was one of his heroes. Isaac grew up a BYU guy. He always wanted to carry on the family legacy in Provo, and he's very much doing it uh, the way that you would hope. Uh, the funny thing about this is Byron was 6'2", 240. Isaac is all of 6'6". Six, six. He has got like the prototypical tight end body. And if Isaac can get back to the level he was playing at before that horrific ankle injury against USC, you're looking at Isaac Rex potentially being an NFL guy as soon as next offseason. I don't want to say that uh, that is going to happen, but it could happen if he is fully healthy. He is a phenomenal player, comes from a phenomenal family. And obviously when your dad was an All-American at BYU, Byron Rex is an easy guy where in the number 95 during his time at BYU, I, I really, I, it was an easy pick when I'm like, oh, I got to put Byron Rex on this list. So uh, we are now inside the 40s firmly with these countdowns. It is crazy to think we are 107 days away from BYU football kicking off the season at USF, but cannot wait to get it here. I, I'm jonesing for football at this point. I am so so looking forward to it, but we will continue to have you covered all off season long. Uh, tomorrow, I talked about the special edition we have coming up. Drake Toll, who hosts Locked On Baylor, he's one of our podcasters here at the Locked On Podcast Network. Will BYU's second opponent is the Baylor Bears. Can BYU get revenge? We're getting you a lay of what uh, the Baylor Bears look like. Had a lot of talent leave to the NFL draft after their breakout season this past year. What is BYU going to be getting into when Baylor comes to Provo on September 10th? Well, Drake will explain on tomorrow's edition of Locked On Cougars. It's a crossover edition, so stay tuned for that. But a big thank you once again for joining us right here on Locked On Cougars and making us your first listen of the day. I want to encourage you guys now to get over to Locked On Big 12, make it your second listen. Of course, we do those Locked On Big 12 roundtables. I was on this week's edition. We talked a lot about what we talked about in the first part of today's show, the uh, new division rules with regards to the conference championship. Also, the initial 25-man counters, uh, getting rid of that rule. We talked a lot about that and some great ideas for what the future of the Big 12 may look like scheduling-wise for football was covered in that podcast. Get it free and available wherever you get your podcasts, just like this one. All right, that's going to do it. Have a great rest of your day. Hope you guys are all doing fantastic. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast for May 19th, 2022, and we will catch you guys tomorrow.